schedule which is uh, actually from me so i invite myself to present this talk uh, this uh, usually uh, is an in house uh, talk uh, coming from the in house uh, person uh, it was uh, planned when we were actually waiting for more guest speakers and then i wanted to withdraw in favor of uh, those guest speakers who have come in later but uh, i was uh, asked not to withdraw and continue with my intention to present this uh, uh, talk so let me just uh, uh, get into the presentation of my talk the topic uh, i chose i worded it as uh, what can contemporary tourist students learn from the equation of satyam and dharma uh, in the hindu thought in the vedic thought let me just uh, sequence my talk as follows first of all let me tell you how we translate satyam and dharma for the contemporary students of jurisprudence satyam can roughly be translated as truth dharma can roughly be translated as law but law not just as a law made by a sovereign a command of uh, the sovereign law in many other senses also like laws of nature uh, laws uh, of various sciences and laws as they operate in creation so in such sense in such general sense of law or property or characteristic or feature dharma gets translated as law and there is a whole debate historical debate historicist debate about uh, the use of the word satyam and dharma and their interrelation in the ancient indian scriptures and literature if i say equation of satyam and dharma just of god people might not agree with me it is true i should also say that uh, satyam and dharma are two different entities in most of the literature you have satyam and dharma as two Uh, different words two different concepts and two different entities true and on the contemporary jurisprudence side is there an equation between truth and law is the question that we need to take up but on the ancient hindu thought side is there an equation between satyam and dharma yes there is is the categorical answer there are statements which amount to satyam eva dharma satyam itself is dharma but it does not mean that that is an all pervading principle that is the all pervading maxim or that is an all pervading or eternal essential statement of the dharma view of hindu thought it is true that uh, satyam has been mentioned in various sources as one kind of dharma as one of the dharmas and second stage we can see not in a very chronological or consequential uh, sequential way but when we classify the occurrence of the words of satyam and dharma we can see the presence of satyam along with dharma as satyam being one kind of dharma second as a word and concept paired with dharma satyam dharma coming parallel to each other 
then there is the third uh, level third phase where you see the equation between satyam and dharma where it is said that satyam and dharma are one and the same satyam is dharma and dharma is satyam then if we go to uh, satyam as one kind of dharma satyam as one kind of ethic satyam as one kind of code satyam as one kind of principle then we are talking about satya vak speaking the truth and there when we are talking about speaking the truth we are we have two kinds of speaking the truth speaking the fact as it is known to the speaker at the time of speaking articulating the fact as known to the speaker at the time of speaking there is the other side speaking making a statement and executing the statement after stating it which also translates to promise keeping when you are doing promise keeping promise keeping has been described in ancient indian scriptures as satya va then the question comes what is satya work in promise keeping is the fact first or speaking first sequentially which is first in the sense of making a statement of a fact that is known to the speaker at the time of speaking fact is first and speaking is next but truth when it is translated as promise keeping statement is first speaking is first and fact comes next both these fact first and speaking next and speaking first and fact next both are considered to be truth speaking or satya vak or if you are going to this aspect of promise keeping what is the position in contemporary jurisprudence for that promise keeping usually promise keeping becomes a very significant and central vital aspect of the law of contract and any student of law while being taught the contract act or law of contract is told that it is the law of laws contract law is the law of laws all the aspects like estoppel they come from contract law being the law of laws shri saidipak ji was bringing commercial legal practice in the morning and as part of that the most sensational cases of recent times are cases of corporate governance and these cases of corporate governance or the cases of promise keeping only they are cases of cases where the businessman is not keeping the promise made to the registrar of companies in the form of the uh, memorandum or document that he submits to the registrar of companies at the time of registering his joint stock company that breaking the promise to the registrar of companies amounts to breaking the promise to the shareholders also because it is the same promise that it, that is communicated to all the prospective shareholders of the joint stock company and it is the promise breaking that is happening to uh, the state also 
because state in the form of registrar of companies is the upholder of the promise made by the businessman to the shareholders of the company and it is the breaking of promise to the customers of the company also so ultimately the corporate governance cases are promise breaking cases cases of promise breaking and as per indic perspective this promise issue comes as part of satyam satyam in the form of fact coming next to the statement making so this is one example of how it all pervading including the commercial practice the contract law is and how that law of laws is actually a law of truth a law of satyam law of satyam in the form of satya vak so the contemporary student of jurisprudence contemporary student of uh, legal philosophy is also being told though not using the word truth they are not using this in the course but they are being told when they are told that contract law is the law of laws that truth speaking is the fundamental legal principle so satyam when it is being mentioned as a vital aspect of dharma this is what is one of the aspects of satyam being a vital aspect of dharma that is dispute resolution or governance or law or jurisprudence or legal practice this is one example of that but why there is a pairing of satyam and dharma regularly satyam when it is mentioned for example in sources like uh, mundaka upanishad interestingly that statement from the upanishad is the motto for the government of india satyam eva jayate and what is next to that न अनृत सत्यम जयते न अनृत एंड एटिमोलॉजिकली वॉट इज अनृत इट इज नई तत्पुरुष सो यू हेव दि नई प्लस रितम देर एंड वेन दिस रितम एंड सत्यम आर कमिंग टूगेदर वी आर लुकिंग एट रितम एज एन एस्पेक्ट ऑफ सत्य as synonym to satyam but when you go to many other sources where the word ratham is mentioned there ratham ritam is brought in as a synonym for dharma that is where many sources many dharma analysis dharma interpreting texts have seen ritam as the place where dharma and satyam join together ritam is both an aspect of satyam and dharma and there are some sources of dharma analysis which show that dharma has two aspects its relative aspect and its absolute aspect and it is relative dharma which is generally understood as dharma but the absolute aspect of dharma is being called as ritam same way satyam is also always classified into a relative satyam and an absolute satyam a relative truth and an absolute truth and these analysis show that ritam is the absolute satyam so where absolute truth and absolute dharma absolute law they join ritam comes so it is argued in the dharma analysis that that absolute level where the truth and law truth and dharma satyam and dharma join there ritam is the word to be used for satyam and dharma together that is one analysis uh, that has been brought in but uh, 
uh, we can either agree with that or disagree with that. But what we can say, what, what we can categorically see in statements is that Satyam and Dharma have been made, made equal. They have been equated. There are places where it is mentioned that Satyam is Dharma. And what is interesting is that there are recent articles like uh, that of uh, Julius Lipner, which actually interested me the most. His article is called The Truth of Dharma and the Dharma of Truth, Reflections on Hinduism as a Dharmic Faith. It is in this article that uh, Professor Julius Lipner, who uh, has a very good grounding in uh, Indian uh, philosophy, uh, he was brought up in India. He was uh, uh, he studied in Indian universities like Jadavpur University with a very good Indic background. He went abroad to teach in Oxford and other places. So in this article, which is a 2019 article, uh, he says uh, this article discusses what it might mean to characterize traditional Hinduism in, as a dharmic faith in relation to the concepts of truth and its opposite Andhratam without, however, expatiating on supposed contrast between Hinduism and Abrahamic faiths. The argument is conducted by recognizing two senses to Andhratam, namely non-truth and falsehood in contrast to Satyam and the method used is inductive in that a historically well-known episode of Mahabharata, the story of Kaushika and the bandits and its authoritative interpretation by the deity Krishna in terms of Satyam and Andhatam are analyzed heuristically to indicate how dharma is viewed in the tradition qua ethical concept. The conclusion is drawn that Hindu dharma is understood as that whose objective is ultimately to bring about the welfare of the world, loka sangraha, in relation to truth and its opposite materially. Dharma is invariably contextual in connotation, in contrast to what might be a Kantian or absolutist reading of moral imperatives, whereas formally at the hands of one commentator or other, not least in modern times, dharma is that which defines what it means to be Hindu. The material and formal connotations of dharma thus analyzed and taken together set Hinduism apart qua dharmic faith. So this uh, article, shows uh, a very important episode, the Kaushika episode, where you get a nuance that there is a, an ethical untruth and an unethical truth also. There are truth speaking, truth speakings in this Kaushika episode. There is a truth speaking, which is an unethical truth speaking. And there is an ethical speaking of untruth in the Dharmaraja Yudhishthira episode during the war. And the basis of ethicality or unethicality of truth speaking or untruth speaking in this argument is brought from Dharma. So as long as Dharma and Dharma is the welfare of the other individual. So there the nuanced arguments of Dharma are uh, actually the whole discussion about ethical untruth and unethical truth, they come from the relativist understanding of this. Relativist understanding of truth and relativist understanding of dharma also. But when you uh, see the equation between satya and uh, satyam and dharma, what the dharmagnas, I was mentioning this word dharmagnya, that is the analysts and philosophers of dharma are talking about is the absolute state. In the absolute state of dharma and satyam, there is no such distinction of ethical untruth or unethical truth. This is from where I am coming. For me, the discussion of uh, truth and dharma, when you are taking the meaning of uh, law for dharma, it goes beyond just the law of the land, law as the command of a sovereign, or positive law, or natural law, which were actually debating at the beginning of the introduction of positive law 
during the introduction of uh, contemporary jurisprudence it goes to the laws of nature also and interestingly i found discussions on laws of nature and natural law together a very important publication natural law and laws of nature in early modern europe jurisprudence theology moral and natural philosophy which is edited by michael stolius and lauren batson uh, has a very big number of uh, articles uh, collected in the discussion between laws of nature and natural law laws of nature is the word that covers uh, philosophy of science or science basically it comes from science and this volume is discussing the stolis and datson volume is discussing the relationship between laws of nature uh, as discussed in sciences and natural law as discussed in philosophy in contrast to the positive law uh, as positioned in natural law in legal philosophy but if you look at the way dharma has been discussed uh, in the morning sai deepak ji and uh, uh, dr peddada ji all of them were also mentioning the issues of environmental law sai deepak ji was mentioning how environmental law is an area where the indic jurisprudence uh, can make a very big contribution and repeatedly speakers of the day have been mentioning how in the legal philosophy of india in uh, the philosophy of dharma the uh, sridhar potraju garu was mentioning this the distinction is not made between human and the other creatures it is not anthropocentric legal philosophy of india is not anthropocentric it takes into consideration all the creatures of nature so if you are really interested uh, that is a judicial practitioner if a judicial practitioner is interested in taking the uh, definition of the entity that you are dealing with beyond human if you do not want to be anthropocentric in your philosophy of jurisprudence then if you want to go beyond humans then environmental law being one of the laws is a lopsided view in my perspective environmental law has to be made the law of laws it is only then that laws of nature which are the ones studied by natural sciences unlike the pre environmental awareness days where the world view of science investigation was controlling nature dominating nature gradually the movement inside sustainable development eco friendly science investigation <laughs> one of the science organizations in my city has a motto called science with a human face so if you want to do science with human face then what you are doing is a eco friendly nature friendly science then laws of nature investigated with a an approach of a sustaining nature then laws of nature or environmentalist laws of nature then you are coming to an environmentalist science and then the laws of nature investigated from that perspective it is these laws of nature which should become the fundamentals of law making and the indian perspective with regard to dharma is that it is not to be made it is already it already is the laws of nature or dharma there are n number of occasions where for example sridhar potraju gar was giving an example and others uh, uh, sridhar uh, dr sri lakshmi peddada was also giving an example here a wild creature a carnivorous creature 
claims that its carnivorous habits are its dharma. Dharma not just as a characteristic, dharma as a duty. So all properties of all entities in nature are the duties of that entity because all the natural characteristics of all the entities of nature, all the components of nature are contributing to the self-regulatory and self-sustaining sustenance of nature. This basic principle makes the property analysis of sciences into a deontological analysis. It makes the characteristic of an entity to be the duty of that entity. So this deontological uh, analysis of dharma, may, it is the point where you are joining both the characteristic, the meaning of dharma as a characteristic and meaning of dharma as duty into the same. Then when you are realizing this, then you are able to join the laws of nature as the law. Law with uppercase. Law. And this law is not the command of the sovereign. It is the command of nature. It is the command of creation. And there is a number of discussions in legal philosophy, in jurisprudence about kinds of truth. For example, legal truth and substantive truth have been contrasted. And in those publications, in those articles in jurisprudence where they have contrasted the uh, legal truth and the substantive truth, most of the authors keep repeating that if legal truth is moving away from the substantive truth, there is a dissatisfaction coming from the clients. And that culminated dissatisfaction leads to a rebellion against the judicial system. So, as far as possible, the legal practitioners have to make their legal truth closer to the substantive truth is the argument. Where is the substantive truth? It is not just the substantive truth of the case on hand. It is, if you go beyond this, it is the substantive truth of nature. And if you don't realize that the substantive absolute truth that is governing nature as loss of nature on all the claims of scientists that they are investigating the truth, scientific truth. It is that the truth which is in the form of loss of nature. And if you agree that a nature-friendly, eco-friendly, environmentalist investigation of the truth, the scientific truth through the loss of nature by scientists is an inescapable law, not made by a sovereign as a command or not as a natural law that was believed in. It is the law that exists as a substantive truth. Then you would realize that the more your lawmaking and law execution and law dispute resolution and law adjudication is closer to that ultimate substantive truth, then you would realize that even nature does not revolt against you. So lest nature does not revolt against you, it is the responsibility of even the judicial field, not just the field of technology, not just the field of scientists, even the judicial field has to realize that their legal truth has to be, and legislative truth also, on the side of legislators also, they should realize that the lawmaking also has to keep that legislative truth and legal truth and scientific truth all have to ultimately be the closest to or be one with the ultimate uh, truth of substantive truth of nature itself. Then one of the benefits of this is that uh, the natural sciences will become the basis of uh, social sciences and human sciences, including jurisprudence. That is what is, I think, the lesson for the contemporary 
jurisprudence that environmental law or law of environment which is which comes from natural sciences investigation uh, in eco friendly natural science investigation that can become the law of laws in jurisprudence that is what the contemporary jurisprudence can learn from the uh, philosophy of satyam equating with dharma from uh, the hindu thought or the vedic thought that has been articulated in all the vedic sources thank you very much <laughs>